I'm Ed Connor, Seattle City Light. I've been working with Seattle City Light for the last 15 years. My primary job is to work on endangered fish recovery and research. So if it's bull trout, Chinook salmon, or steelhead, it's right up my alley. I'm also a member of the Puget Sound Technical Recovery Team, was appointed by NOAA to do this, and now presently on the Steelhead Planning Team. One thing that uh, Luke mentioned, wanted me to point out is my last presentation, I only anticipated 10 minutes for, so we'll get to cut out of here earlier, so just hang on. Here we go, this is what we're talking about, steelhead smolts, uh, in the Skagit River, again, we've been doing this study since 2006, uh, on and off. We only were able to get actual wild smolts in the Skagit in the last couple of years, and that was because the Upper Skagit Tribe received a EPA grant. They were able to put some screw traps, smolt traps in, which I'll show you in a second, in some major tributaries. We tried beforehand. Remember, Kurt, we tried to get steelhead smolts? They're really hard to catch steelhead smolt because they want out and they're not eating much. And so we tried our hardest, but we were not really able to track steel, wildhead steelhead smolts in the Skagit until the last couple of years when uh, the Upper Skagit Tribe and WDFW uh, through grant funds with the EPA were able to install smolt traps in major trips. And finally we got hold, you can see it has an adipose fin here. Clip here is a genetic sample, but our typical uh, wild steelhead smolt, a bit on the small side, but that's about right. 170 millimeters is a yeah, good looking smolt. So what we've done is using uh, some, actually some upgrade in technology we've had in the last couple of years. And again, uh, Rick Hilborn actually published an article in the Nat over at UW, uh, actually described this as sort of a revolutionary way of looking at fish. It's ability to put a sonic tag, a hydroacoustic tag in a fish. I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. Uh, it's a pinger, it sounds just like the submarine ping you hear on, uh, uh, the Red October movie, you know, it's just basically just like that. Hunt for Red October. It's a sonic signal. It's coded so we can detect this underwater uh, up to a half a kilometer away, depending upon conditions. And it also, every fish has a tag put in it. The tags are not cheap, about 300 bucks a piece. They go for about three or four months, 150 days right now is about what they put out and they put out a sonic, tag, a sonic tag and we can tell the exact identity of the fish. Unlike pit tags and other tags, this thing transmits so if a fish goes by a certain point, we can detect it. And so this is our release sites. We have smolt traps on Hanson Creek, Finney Creek, Alabit Creek, and Bacon Creek. And I'm gonna be comparing two studies here uh, or actually two years in 2013 was our first time to really get our hands on some wild fish. And so uh, we actually tagged fish wild smolts at these traps, released them to see what happened. And then 2014 we had a special study and this was more relevant to the entire Puget Sound study that Mike just did, Michael just did a good job of doing. The schedule had a special role in this 2014 study and this was to provide calibration for the rest of the studies. The reason we were doing calibration is because we have one last line where the fish check out. And this is a, I'll show you a picture of it in a second here. It's a string of hydrophones, 32 of them that go across the entire Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, one side, it goes in, starts on one shore in US, goes up to Canada. And this is capable of detecting almost all the fish. Uh, the majority of folks in the Puget Sound use a smaller tag. That's better, it's, it's smaller, it, it, and by being smaller, it transmits less power. And we call that a V7 tag. And I'll show a picture again in a second here. Uh, and we had no idea what the detection efficiency is of these. So it was really critical to find out how many of these V7 tags we actually get at certain types uh, sites, especially at the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Do we detect 100% of them, 50%, 25%? That percentage makes a huge difference 
on what the survival rate is. Because if we don't detect very few fish, it could be we're just not detecting them and they're going past just fine. So uh, we did tag these fish here and then we did get hatchery fish in 2014 from the Marble Mound Hatchery. These 100 fish were very special fish in 2014. They were their only Chambers Creek fish released that year. They were a special group. The rest of them went to find new homes in eastern Washington. These 100 fish, and we had to work with Kurt, so thank you very much, Kurt, in getting an exception to the settlement agreement. And it was too bad we didn't learn about this earlier, but this is the first time I've ever worked on a study where we're holding fish and waiting for a phone call from the Attorney General's office to say, can we, do the fish live? Or alternatively, do the, we whack them on the head, pull the tags off, and then use them sometime later? So it was a very unusual situation, but Kurt was really good at helping out. We waited on the tag, and we actually got to tag our hatchery fish. And, and, and we did need, we used, uh, let me get into a second. So here's what the small traps look like. This is on, uh, I can name this stream, Alabit Creek. They're also on Finney Creek good old Finney Creek, uh, Bacon Creek, and then there's a fish fence on Hanson Creek that was used to collect wild steelhead smolts. Here's a wild steelhead smolt on the hand, that's Clayton Kinsel, and then Shauna with WDFW who were doing all the work on this for the last few years. This is what a V7 tag looks like. They're actually quite small, seven millimeters uh, in length and uh, that's what we put in the fish. Each one of those is 300 bucks. But they provide a lot of information we've never had before. We can actually track steelhead all the way through the river, down river through the Puget Sound and out through the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And in some cases, we've actually collected these out at like Sook Harbor and out along the west coast of Vancouver Island where the Canadians have receivers. Uh, so here's Eric Jeans, our expert surgeon at R2, and uh, Catherine Murillo. Uh, he does, he's really good, has this down to two minutes. The entire surgery takes two minutes. The tag is put in a steelhead smolt. It's put under an anesthetic. They're slipped in. They're ready to go. And then we typically watch them for several days to make sure they survive. Barry Bergerkian at NOAA Fisheries has actually tagged uh, wild and hatchery steelhead smolts, and actually they have no, very low mortality if you have a good surgeon in putting these uh, tags in. Here's a little fish, and actually this is a surgery, and the fish has w water put with a turkey baster, very high-tech equipment there, into its gills, and that has a uh, uh, anesthetic put in it so the fish are out, and then we do watch them, but this is, I couldn't even get a picture of the tag, he's so fast. But uh, everything is anesthetic, it's a uh, field surgery set center. And then this is what we detect them this, with. This is a V2 receiver. Uh, these go underwater, they have a battery. They have a battery that lasts for a year. And uh, they pick up any fish that go by this thing. Uh, they ping every 30 seconds to a minute and a half. That we actually call a ping, because that's what it sounds like. And it picks up the signal and detects if a fish goes by. Here's a picture of Dave throwing one in the river, weighted down, this is up by Shovel Spur Rapids. And we had, I think, around 35 to 40 of these throughout the Skagit River. Here's Eric downloading data from them in the lower Skagit. So there's the receiver, we hook it up, download the data every six months or so. We download all the data to see which fish have gone by. And so this is actually our receiver network. Don't ask me to count them all up, but there's a lot of them out there. It took a lot of effort to put these out. Each one of these is a site where we're looking at fish from the upper Skagit up at uh, Bacon Creek, the Marble Mount Gauge. We have one in, near Labbit Creek, a number down at Concrete uh, Sauk, to pick up Sauk River. Uh, that one's in the wrong place. Well, the dang river disappeared in this slide, but that's okay. All the way down Cedro, Woolley, Mount Vernon, the forks, so we can tell if they're going out the North Fork or the South Fork. And then we have a bunch out in uh, Deception Pass, including two 
that bound either side of Deception Pass. So if the fish are going north, we can tell if they're going north. If the fish are going south, we can catch them between Otsalady Bay and our Pornell Point. So we can tell which way the fish are going once they check out of the system. And uh, that's not all. We all, uh, NOAA Fisheries has a receiver set. We call this a line across Admiralty Inlet. So if the fish are going south, taking a left and down through Port Susan area and down around Camino Island, we can catch them there. And then this is the mother. This is the most important line of all. Any fish that this is maintained by the offshore tracking network, that's a Canadian consortium that we're a member of. Uh, and this is the Bay Kahuna line here. This goes across the entire Strait of Juan de Fuca. And with our V9 tags, we did experimental tags on this. In, two in 2013, we did white wild fish. We did a lot of analysis. We found out we were detecting 100% of the fish just by, we had an, an average of 200 detections per fish for a period of sometimes up to a day and a half as they passed through this line. So it was more than enough. Typically, if we had one or two detections, that's pretty good. Five to six, you know you're detecting some of them, but average of 200 detections per fish, that's, and, and, and they go off every minute, minute and a half. That's a good number of detections we're getting through. So uh, anyhow, there's two ways to go through. And this is one of the things we were able to do with this study that actually added on and kind of complements a lot of what Michael was talking about earlier. There's two different routes. There's actually a third, but they never do it. One is to take a right. Most of the fish that go down the North Fork Skagit, because there's two forks through the Delta, they take a right, they go through Deception Pass, and they travel a total of 78 miles out to the Strait of Juan de Fuca line, which is down here. Uh, that's route number one. Route number two is they, and this is most of the fish that go to the South Fork, take a left, they go down here along Camino Island, uh, Whidbey Island, they take a long left here, go through our Admiralty line here, so this is Noah's Admiralty line. This is the one that I've set up uh, with Dave Flug and R2. This is our small but very important Deception Pass line, and then they all punch out here at the Canadian Strait of Juan de Fuca line. If they go this way, they travel 79, eight, eight miles through the Puget Sound. If they go the long route, it's 129 miles. And this just shows the steelhead mi smolt migration distances. In 2014, released them at Marble Mount, so from the Cascade River. It's actually a total of, to Skagit Bay, it looks like it's around 80 miles here. By the time they get to De uh, Deception and, uh, or Admiralty, it depends. This is the same, which is for all fish, they're going down the Skagit River, around 85 miles from Marble Mount downstream, downriver, uh, to get through the Skagit River until they get to Skagit Bay. Then they take either a left or right, so this just shows the cumulative distances each route. Again, as I mentioned, in, in 2014, we want to at least provide some services and add to this uh, great smolt study that Michael has been talking about. And so the Skagit provided, we have two tags here, the smaller tag, we put in 50 will uh, hatchery fish from the Marble Mount hatchery that had the same tag that most folks use, which is the seven, the seven, this is the smaller tag, fits in almost all steelhead smolts. We do need some bigger kahuna fish to fit into this bigger tag here. And it does fit into our wild fish too, but we do have to be a bit selective and make sure the smolt is at least 185 millimeters or just as oversized. We try to keep the tags at 2% or less of the fish's length to just make, make sure that they survive. So we released all these tags in 2014. This was a detection efficiency test for the Puget Sound Marine Study to basically figure out what the ratio of detections were at the Strait of Juan de Fuca between what I call this high-powered fog cutter tag versus the normal tag. Uh, the smolts were released all on May 13th. And again, we used to calculate the detection rate of the V7 tags that everybody in our sort of marine study collective are using. And we were the only ones to use these bigger V9 tags. 
Uh, that's our, that's Steve Stout, and that's our uh, surgery operation at the Marble Mount Hatchie, and that's just where it happened to the 100 fish. These are the only Chambers Creek fish that, again, were allowed and tagged, uh, but that's our typical surgical setup here. And here's what happened. This is our 2014 hatchery smolts. Uh, very interesting, 52% uh, of the smolts actually went through deception pass. The net marine survival rate, or the detection rate we detected, looking at the fish that were actually detected in Skagit Bay, we found most of them out there. Uh, they were, you know, we, we have very good re detection rates based on our studies in uh, the Skagit Bay. So 52% of them went out, and these are hatchery smolts, with a net 41% survival rate from uh, the North Fork Skagit outlet to the Strait of Juan de Fuca line. If they go the other route, around uh, Camino and up this way, and it would be, and out and take the long route, that's 48% of the smolts went out that way, took the long route, but notice that their marine survival rate is only 22%. It's almost half of that of those that go through Deception Pass. This is a finding we call it death by distance. That was kind of uh, what we call it, in the, and it does collaborate what Michael was talking about earlier. The farther distance that steel had have to travel, the more likely they're going to run into something that doesn't like them. So it's the, the shorter time and the faster they can get at and the shorter distance is a really good thing. And that may be the reason why uh, what Michael was saying earlier, the Nisqually is a long way to go. And so those fish that have to go the longest distance seem to have the lowest survivor routes or survivor rates. Uh, this data is, uh, Dave and I have both worked up this data. It's really interesting. Uh, this is 2014 data, but it's nearly identical to our 2013 data, so I've just doubled up the information here. Uh, this is the migration time and days. Uh, Michael mentioned earlier fish move really fast, but this still kind of blows my mind. Fish are going almost between 150 and 240 miles here between the Upper Skagit Marble Mount Hatchery all the way out the Strait of Juan de Fuca, depending upon route. On average, they're only spending a week and a half in the Skagit River, so they're booking 10 days. They're spending to 12 days on average in the Skagit, and no real difference between deception and my admiralty route. I don't know if they've made up their mind. They don't know which way they're going to go, so that should be the same time. Uh, Michael mentioned this earlier and some others. The total time through the Skagit Delta in the estuary is only a day and a half. That's it. In comparison, a Chinook salmon uh, juvenile may spend spends in the estuary 35 days. So these things are just rocketing through the estuary. So bottom line, steelhead are not big estuary users. They're getting, uh, the, the, there's one thing a steelhead is trying to do here. As uh, John was mentioning earlier, they're bigger. They're faster, they've been in for two to three months, and they have one thing in mind based on this data, which is get the hell out of Dodge City, I wanna to get to the Queen Charlotte's and south and to Alaska, and then out to the mid-Atlantic to start eating squid as fast as I can. So these things have a, basically, they're moving so fast and moving out in May, that they're out in Alaska about three to four months earlier than any other salmonid. So it may be an adaptation that still had, are basically getting there much faster and earlier than anybody else. So not very much time. And then this blew me away too. This was a very short, it, to go through the entire Puget Sound out of the Skagit, Average four days from the North Fork Skagit all the way out to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. That's 78 miles. They're doing that in four days. The alternative route through Admiralty is more like seven, eight days, but that makes sense because they got to go almost twice as far. And so our total time is between two and three weeks. They're doing the entire migration from the upper river to getting out of the Puget Sound. That's 250 miles. 150 to 240 miles. They're doing that between two and three weeks. They're rocketing. Uh, I, then we know the distances. Here's the speed. And I was wondering, are they slowing down or what are they doing? 
they're actually moving, and I have one put mile per hour equals one and a half foot per second. The average velocity of the Skagit at this time period is around three, four feet per second. So these things are actually in the river. They're uh, moving between 2.2 and 0.3 mi miles per hour. I mean, that's slow, but it's still, they're you know, compared to other fish, they're moving pretty quick. So they're actually moving quite a bit slower than average river speed, but they're still getting out, you know, again, a week out of the river. In the day, this is kind of Delta Bay, they're not there very long, they're accelerating a little bit, but once they hit the marine environment, they speed up. They must really know how to use the currents and pull to the side during the end tide, and then when it's a flood or it's an exit tide going out, then they go back out. So they're actually speeding up to about almost a mile per hour when they're exiting the marine environment. And here's your average of about 0.4. So this was ex ex kind of interesting how the fish actually accelerate through their life history from one area to another. So here's the bottom line, and then I'm almost done with this, is this is our 2014 hatchery smolt tagging result. And this is sort of what show, uh, Michael was talking about. I'm gonna show this for 2014 hatchery fish, and then I'm gonna show this for 2013 wild fish. And this is a real kind of major difference. The one major factor we found in 2014, which was kind of unusual, is we had a major attrition in that 85 miles between the Cascade Hatchery where we had 100% of the fish, well, we start out with 100% released of the tags, 100 tags. By the time we got out to the estuary, uh, we only found 38 of them. And then they got through the estuary with a little decrease, and then if they got out to, by Deception Pass, they went the short route, they ended up with about 15% uh, Mortal, uh, basically net survival rate. And the curve actually extends out no matter what way you go. So I just add Admiralty on, and they punched out around 8% at Admiralty. So again, it's very similar for these hatchery fish to uh, what Michael was talking about for uh, wild fish. So here's what happened with the wild smolts 40%. This year in 2013 went the north route and the majority went 60% went the long route. 50% marine survival rate that for those fish that went through deception pass for wild fish, but only 19% marine survival rate for the fish that went the long way. So this is something that was kind of mind blowing. It's like, whoa, if they go the long way, we lose a lot of fish and these fish are precious. So. What we need is someone probably, you know, Bill McMillan, if you could tell a fish to take a right, instead of taking a left, go out to North Fork and do the deception. Don't go down through, the, you know. It's, it's, it, that, that would be something, you know. Maybe that, I, I, as a utility, I'm not gonna say this, damn the South Fork, but no. Some way to just tell the fish to go to the right and instead of taking a left, it could almost double their survival rate. So this is kind of something that we have to think about. It gives us some ammunition. Nick, you have a question? Just a question. So what was the answer on the B9 versus the B7 tags? Was that, was that survival rate both tags? Sorry, 2013, you're using the B7s, right? In 2013, we used V9s. You used V9s on yeah, larger fish? On, on larger wild fish. And so are the B9s, What's the, what's the answer on relative detection for these seven? And I was going to give that, yeah, that's, but, but, and, and that was the so bottom line working. for Michael. That was the bottom line for everybody else. And it turned out that we found again that we're detecting, we get a lot of hits with those high powered V9 tags. We had the V7 tag, and the answer was 67% detection rate of straight Awanda Fuca for V7s. So Megan and Barry, are now using that 67% as the detection efficiency for the rest of the Puget Sound. But at the same time, we did get some very, uh, you know, very interesting information out of this thing. 
Uh, V9 is almost, a, is, we're, we're, we're assuming it's 100%, and that's just our assumption, but that's based upon a lot of data analysis, both we and NOAA statisticians have done in looking at just how many detections and the duration of detections. We actually mapped out, well, I won't go into it, but we spent a lot of time on it at the Strait of Juan de Fuca line. So that was, that was a very, well, the problem line is, is that that was borrowed from a Canadian study in the Strait of, Georgia, you know, the Strait of Georgia. We had no, it was 68% that they came up with, but we had no data to actually calibrate ourselves. And so this was used to calibrate, but also it provides a nice interesting comparison as well as far as we can do. This is kind of interesting here is our 2013. Remember that we lost for the hatchery fish we had only 30 percent, 35 percent get out of the fresh water. Well for wild steelhead smolts and this is all I've done some adjustments for distances from the smolt traps. So the scale is a little shorter because these fish did not go as far but because uh, some of them were released from Finney Creek, Alabit, Bacon Creek upstream, and then Hanson downstream, I weighted it to an average difference, different di distance, excuse me. But nearly 80% of the wild fish got out of the Skagit River versus 35% of the hatchery fish. They're different years, but the same type of tags. <laughs> Uh, we had V8, uh, and so we were able to do this, and this is down to the estuary, and it's just, okay, this is kind of an interesting thing here, too. What's going on here? Uh, I don't know what's getting those hatchery fish, why so many of them got whacked, but they were the only 100 hatchery fish in the Delta this year, and as Kirk Kramer knows, there's a lot of bull trout <laughs> in the Skagit, and one thing I know about hatchery fish versus wild fish, and Barry Berserkian has some very good data on this. He's done a lot of studies, but I've noticed the same thing. Uh, the, the one, pro one major difference between hatchery fish and wild fish is that hatchery fish are, have the intelligence of my chickens. That is, they have no sense of predators, and that every, just like my chickens, every a uh, coyote in Fall City knows where my chickens are located in my backyard. And does that make any difference? If I let them go free range, they all get whacked by predators. So, so that's uh, 2013 wild steelhead. So this is 2013 wild steelhead, then. exactly right. And so that's it. And here, they, uh, if they go out via deception pass, we have the total survival rate is almost 55%, which is very, very much higher than uh, the other studies that have been done in the other rivers. But if they go down to Admiralty route, it's, they do go down to 20%. So interesting stuff. Key findings, the detection efficiency of the V7 tags at the Strait of Juan de Fuca line was calculated to be 67%, so there you go there. Steelhead smolts migrate rapidly downstream the Skagit River, and as I said, spent very little time in the estuary. Uh, survival rates of hatchery steelhead smolts in 2000 were highest in the Skagit Delta and estuary, lowest in the Skagit River. Alternatively, survival rates of wild smolts were highest in the Skagit in the 2013 study. Uh, there's a wide range of uh, between 7 and 14 percent of hatchery smolts uh, survived passage, while 22 to 55 percent of wild smolts uh, with the same type of tags uh, basically be, were found to survive. And just one thing I want to say, there's a lot of fish, and I think this is a real reason for doing this marine study, uh, we're losing a lot of fish in the Puget Sound according to the study, and this is all occurring in a two to three week period. So smolt migration is a very high risk period for steelhead, and something that we haven't thought about a lot, but uh, something we need to pay more attention to. And with that, I just want to throw up some acknowledgments here. Jeans, Catherine Morello, Steve Stout was great at the Marble Mount Hatchery, Clayton Kinsel and Joe Anderson providing us wild smolts in 2013. John Paul Shanahan with the Upper Skagit Tribe uh, providing uh, funding for the smolt traps. Barry Barajerki and Michael Schmidt helped provide some of the funding for our acoustic tags. Kurt Beardsley helped 
uh, bailout to get the fish a pardon, and they were able to be able to use those hatchery fish in 2014. And then Dave Fluke, Seattle City Light, yet to be retired, of course, always working with these on us. So thanks very much.